Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, high value healthcare. And when we first did this work, we started by looking at uh, competition in healthcare, but thinking about competition. So the first thing I want to get you to do is just think about when somebody says the word competition, what comes to your mind? What do you think about? Have an image? Winning, Winning losing, race. race. Rankings. Money. Money. <laughs> that was Stacy Health, just for the record. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, somebody else? Like this? Right? Yeah. So, um, so when, we, um, when, we first, when we first started into this work, a lot of the discussion about what was wrong with U.S. health care was framed around Hey, was framed around the idea that um, the problem with U.S. healthcare was that it had too much competition. It was more than most countries in the world. Um, there was a lot of competition in U.S. healthcare. And then there were other people saying, "No, no, that's not the problem. The problem is there's too little competition." But 15 years ago, as we were starting into this, that was a lot of the debate: too much competition, too little competition. And so I had dragged Mike Porter into this work with me. He's one of the world's leading experts on the topic of competition. Uh, and we looked at this really hard, and we decided that the problem was not too much competition or too little competition, but it's the wrong kind of competition. So let me give you a different view of competition here. How about that? This is a different kind of competition, right? This is the result of economic competition, right? That took us from, do you guys recognize this thing on the left here? <laughs> Let me tell you how this worked. So this thing, you actually had to like dial and wait for it to go back to the right number. So if somebody had a lot of nines in their number, it took a really long time to dial it. And you, um, you know, receiver, but you could only go as far away from the phone as this was. People were forever walking too far and pulling the phone off the counter. It would go crashing to the floor. It sounded horrible on the other end of the line. And then the other really funny thing about it was you had this thing on your kitchen counter. Didn't go with you anywhere, right? So it would ring on your kitchen counter and you weren't there. So if you were um, a little bit tech savvy, you got an answering machine, which most of us very quickly came to pick up on like Friday afternoons. So you would get your messages about once a week on Friday afternoon, at which point you would respond to the people who'd been hoping you were going to go out with them on Wednesday of last week, right? I mean, it just it was a whole different thing. It didn't take pictures of your kids. It didn't hail your taxi. It didn't I mean, you could talk to the bank, but only to get them to tell you that they were closed. I mean, really, it didn't do any of the things that you now expect your, your phone to do, right? Um, it also didn't explode, but, um, <laughs> but it didn't do any of the things that you expect your phone to do now. Because in fact, the, the innovation driven by competition in this sector right, has led to a whole ecosystem of apps and, uh, you know, things that you can do with your phone. So it's not just that the phone itself changed, but the functionality of the phone has changed because of a whole ecosystem around the phone. So this is another way of thinking about competition. And in fact, for a couple of business school professors, which is what my co-author and I were, that's the way we normally thought about competition, which is really different than thinking about competition that way. Right? So, the puzzle, and the way I drew Mike Porter into thinking about this with me, the puzzle is, so why doesn't healthcare innovation have the same kind of dynamic that you have in phone service? I mean, healthcare services are arguably as important as phone services. Life and death, God, I mean, so you would think that you would have had that kind of innovation driving in this other part of the economy. Plus, I mean, think about who's in healthcare. You got these smart, hardworking, caring individuals in healthcare. Wouldn't you think that, uh, that they could drive the right kind of innovation in healthcare? But they're working in a very difficult context. So if we think about what do we mean by the wrong kind of competition and the right kind of competition, 
the wrong kind of competition is now known as volume-based competition. They talk about volume-based and value-based. So volume-based competition, which is about shifting costs. If I can figure out how to get you out of my hospital fast and into your nursing home, then you bear the costs of taking care of the patient in that nursing home, and I'm not bearing the costs of taking care of them in the hospital. Or the health plan set decides that you should have a high deductible plan. So you, as the patient or um, the customer, end up paying the first, you know, paying more of the more of the first dollars of your health care, and for many people, all of the dollars of the health care because of the high deduct cost shifting from one person to another. Um, a lot of the competition was over increasing bargaining power. If the name of the game is going to be to see whether I can shift costs to you, then I want to have as much bargaining power as possible so that when we're fighting over that, I win. Or capturing patients into a limited network and then restricting choices. So you can, um, you can try to capture patients into your health plan and then say, okay, you can't use these providers. You can only use these providers. And then as I'm working with those providers, I have a, a set of customers that I can deliver in a very um, concentrated way so I have more bargaining power and more ability to force you into lower prices. It's all this game about who pays what. But that's what the competition was like, competition to restrict services. I'll make this big list of what my health plan covers. You make this big list of what your health plan covers. Nobody actually reads the 75 pages of what the health plans cover anyway. So you can get away with restricting services and taking things out of what the health plan. But none of that competition, none of the things I've just described create value for patients. None of those things create better health. Right? It's all competition over stuff that is about the healthcare sector, but it's not about health. So it's all competition over the wrong stuff. And all of the kinds of competition I just described are what we call zero-sum competition. If you win, I lose. And if I win, you lose. Zero-sum. Or worse, it could be negative-sum. The classic uh, example of negative sum competition is war. Everybody loses no matter who wins. It takes value out of the system. And in healthcare, there was a lot of negative sum competition because all of the money that was spent on competing over stuff that didn't help patients drove the costs up. So that's negative sum. So you had all this competition all over dividing value, not over creating value. If instead you had competition over increasing value for patients, over helping people to achieve better health and more efficiently achieve better health, then you might see a dynamic more like the phone sector, a dynamic that, where the competition drives improvement in what you're trying to get, in this case health, over time. So that's potentially a positive competition. It's a competition over creating value. And my simple-minded approach to this is to say, you know, the reason for health care is to create and support health for patients, individuals, families, communities. It's the raison d'etre for health care. So creating value should be what we recognize as the goal and the purpose and what we compete over. Not dividing the value that's been created by seeing how much we can fight over who makes the most money off it. Okay, that sounds ridiculously simply, like stupidly simple. That's what was revolutionary about this. I was like, seriously? I mean, once you say it out loud, it seems too obvious, but what you need is competition over creating value, the reason that we're all here. So this is a win-lose competition about dividing value. And what you want is a potentially win-win competition, a competition over creating value. Doesn't mean that everybody wins, right? But when, you, when value is expanding, you have the opportunity to do more and for more people to win, more people to be served. So that's what redefining healthcare was originally looking at, was this notion that the, was that what we didn't have was 
competition on results, competition on health, competition on getting better. What we did have was this misdirected competition about shifting costs and increasing the volume of treatment that somebody gets paid for, rather than improving health. And so the question really that we ask in this was how do we redefine the system? How would you make the system different so that the dynamic was about health, not just about treatment? And when we first tried to publish this, they, um, it was sort of difficult to communicate because it was such a different way of talking about the system than the current dialogue had. It, would just, it just wasn't the way people were talking about it. And the way we got people to see it was to point out that the conversation was all at the wrong level. That when you talk about hospital to hospital competition, you're talking about the wrong thing. Because nobody wants, well, we could check, but would you like an extra weekend in the hospital? It's free. How about an extra colonoscopy? It's laughable, right? That's not why you go for health care, right? So, um, so, so, so that's the point. How do, we, how, do we, how do we get competition to the right level so people compete over the right stuff? And so if you think about hospital to hospital competition, that is the way it's framed now. But OK, now imagine a hospital that's really good at cardiac care and below average at cancer care. So is that a really good hospital, a below average hospital, or an average hospital? Pardon? It depends what you need, right? Um, pardon? It depends. I mean, again, you know, this is like not rocket science, right? But it depends what you need. And so you don't really want to know, is this a four-star hospital or a three-star hospital? You want to know, how is this hospital for what I need? Right? And then they'll say, well, you need a one-stop hospital. And you say, OK, well, what do you mean by that? And they'll say, well, you want to be able to go to the same hospital when you deliver a baby and when you're treated for osteoarthritis. And it's like, chances are those things are going to happen 20, 30, 40 years apart. It's not one stop unless you stay for an awfully long time, which really, I mean, it's not one stop, right? It just, again, it's kind of laughable. But so the point is to think about the competition at the level that value is created for individual people or families. And it depends on what you need. What you're going for is better health. I mean, it seems obvious that that should be the goal. So you're talking about quality of life and dignity of death. We'll get more specific about that in a, in a few minutes. But that's really what it's about, not the waterfall in the lobby, not whether the sheets were soft, um, right? I mean, absolutely, every patient should be treated with dignity and respect. Don't get me wrong on that. I'm not saying that's not important, but it shouldn't be our stretch goal. You don't go to health care for the experience of it, right? Um, that's, I mean, your experience shouldn't be bad, but that's not why you go. It's like electricity. You don't really want to experience your electricity. If you do, Stick your finger in the socket. No, um, you, you don't really want to experience your electricity, right? When you, when you have a service call, you want them to be polite and quick and get, the, get stuff done. But really, you want stuff to work, but without much experience to it. You'd, it's just like health. You'd rather be healthy, but not have to experience a lot of treatment to get there, right? And what does it mean to be healthy? It depends on what you like to do. It has to do with being able to do the things that define you as you. You know, can you, can you do the things that are a big part of your you know, daily life? Of course, the, you know, the joke about this is the guy who comes in and says, but after the hand surgery, doc, will I be able to play the piano? The answer is, well, could you play piano before? Right? Um, so it's, a, you know, it's, it's about the things that you do and the things that, um, that you um, that you, that you care about being able to, able to do in your life. And so when they have these big debates in Washington about the complexity of measuring outcomes, 
Do you know whether you went to school today? I know whether I went to work today. Can you walk up the stairs? Can you see to read? Most of the really important outcomes are things that, um, that you do know whether you did or not. I had a kid who's now, well, he's in a good college, he's doing fine, but during his childhood he was sick for five years and in pain seven days a week during that time. Um, and with that going on, nobody ever asked us, can he go to school? Can he sleep through the night? Does anybody in your house sleep through the night? Because had they asked and realized that the answer was no, you would have realized that maybe there were other things that could be done to help family life continue than what they were trying to do. And all they were trying to do at that point was figure out what the heck is the diagnosis? Because you can't charge in this system unless you have a diagnosis code. So if you have no diagnosis for five years, your doctors don't like you much. So the traditional dilemma when people think about healthcare, talk about healthcare reform, is whether we, need, whether we will spend more or reduce services. They're both bad choices, right? We're gonna do less for people or we're gonna take our spending even higher. It's a false dilemma. Those aren't the only two choices. In spite of the way we talk about it in the newspapers, it's not the only two choices. Our other choice would be to increase the value of the care that we deliver. So what do we mean by value? We're talking about the health outcomes that matter to patients for the money it takes to achieve them. So we're not gonna ignore spending, but we're not gonna just say that what reform needs to accomplish is lower spending. Actually, so after my youngest son got well and I was starting in on this work, I took a year of unpaid leave to write Redefining Healthcare. And he was, um, he walked up to the table and I have this kitchen table with stacks of papers and stuff all over it because I'm you know, writing at home. And he comes to Mom, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm actually, I'm writing a book. What's it about? Well, it's about value in healthcare. He's eight, right? You know, like, value in healthcare, what does that mean? So I said, well, it's about the health that you get for the money that you spend. So when you go to the doctor, you should you know, get better. And um, then he said, isn't that obvious? And I said, well, it's not the way the conversation goes now. He said, how does the conversation go now? And I said, right now, everybody's worried about figuring that, every, that you know, it's all good enough, um, and they're just worried about uh, reducing spending. And he said, mom, if really what they wanted to do was reduce spending, when I showed up at the doctor's office, they'd shoot me. <laughs> He didn't have much experience with lawyers. He didn't know how expensive that approach might have been. Um, but no, no, I'm kidding. But he, um, but you know, but his his point's well taken, right? I mean, you've got to consider the outcomes achieved for the money spent. It's not just a matter of making it cheaper. And not all places achieve the same outcomes. So it's not necessarily true that cheaper is better. If things are identical, then you want to pay the least you can for those identical things. But if things aren't identical then you want to be sure that you're achieving good enough outcomes for, for what you're buying. So the biggest people will ask from this, but can we afford to focus on getting better outcomes? Isn't it all too expensive already? Can we afford to focus on better outcomes? And so the first, again, really simple insight is that poor health drives spending. If you don't want that extra weekend in the hospital, that extra colonoscopy, if you don't want extra stuff, then you go, then you seek health care to avoid or reverse poor health or injury, right? And so it's poor health fundamentally that drives spending. So we can go back here and realize that there's a connection between the different parts of the equation, that, um, that the health you achieve may drive down costs. It's not just that you have to spend more to achieve better health. So if you had, I hope you don't, I don't, but if you had type two diabetes and it never advanced to neuropathy and kidney failure, those would be great outcomes, but it would also be less expensive, right? Because you wouldn't have to get treatment for those extra things. So poor health drives spending, and that, that really wasn't how people had been thinking about it before. But inherently, living in good health is less expensive than living in poor health. And think about your, you know, your grandmothers. 
when, if they, when they're living in good health, they don't need much, but as they get, if they get um, infirmed or as they get disabled or as they get multiple chronic diseases, it's inherently more expensive to take care of them. Right? Um, so it's inherently less expensive to live in good health. Still, this question persists, can we afford better health? The most powerful way to increase value is to improve health outcomes in ways that reduce costs or that reduce demand for more acute services. And there are things where this should be really obvious and it somehow isn't handled that way. So for stroke, the protocols for stroke treat all strokes as if they were sort of medium-sized strokes. It's therefore the wrong treatment for a very severe stroke. Stroke treatment um, is a drug that dissolves clots. It's sort of like using Drano. But for a really bad clot, you need Roto-Rooter. And there actually is a procedure that goes in and busts up the clot mechanically, like, like Roto-Rooter. Uh, and in a really, really big stroke, if there's still a lot of active brain, enough penumbra, then you would want to actually bust up the clot and allow faster blood flow. Somebody who has a big clot who um, is, can't raise their arms, can't smile with both sides of their mouth, can't speak and tell you their name, may need that, that type of care. And you can do an image and figure out if there's enough brain left to make it worth going in and saving it or if the brain's already been killed by the clot. But that's not the way care is normally delivered. And so the one-size-fits-all treatment doesn't get the right treatment to the right people. And if you stroke is the leading cause of long-term disability. So there's all kinds of disability and additional spending that's going on because we're not thinking about it in terms of the outcomes we achieve for the money spent. So when you're thinking about it this way, you're driving for more health, more success from the treatments that we give, more efficiency, and then just fewer problems, fewer treatments, less redundancy, fewer hassles in the system. So let me give you two examples. I'm going to give you one example that's from Germany, but it's migraines. And so my, um, my, um, my thought is that uh, many of you may know someone who has experienced migraines or seen this, that it's probably, uh, it's a condition that um, even at your age you probably have some familiarity with, um, as opposed to a lot of the things that tend to happen older. Um, and then the other example I'll show you is an example from Del Met. Okay. So this example, this is the way, this is sort of a picture of the structure of care for migraines before this innovation project in Germany. And it's very much like it is in the US. There are different providers in different specialties. And if someone has a migraine, you, you go to someone. You might go to your primary care physician, or they might tell you, well, really, you should see a neurologist. Or they might say, really, you should see a physical therapist. Or, um, or let's, um, you know, this looks like this might be a caffeine addiction. Maybe you need um, detox, but detox, but there are different possible root causes. Those are treated at different places. And so someone with migraines will tend to get bounced around from one place to another. And if you've already missed five days of work or school from a migraine, you don't want to spend the next three days seeking care. So there tend to be these big delays as people are trying to manage their life and manage the migraines. And in this system, organized in this fragmented way, most patients don't get effective care, and they often don't get appropriate care. They often don't get to the root cause of what's causing their migraine. So they created this new model, and it was a, a provider and a health plan working together. But in the new model, on the first visit, a neurologist, a psychologist, and a physical therapist each saw the patient in that first visit and together decided what was probably the root cause. So they could then triage patients into it's basically three major categories. And the biggest of those categories were people who then went to this day hospital. It's a week of treatment um, every day, all day, every day, mostly not involving doctors, teaching people how to succeed with the lifestyle changes that you need to make to manage migraine triggers and to appropriately manage the medications that help people to be 
uh, free of migraines. So it's a very different integrated team model of how they delivered this, of how they delivered this care. And then they had communications with network neurologists who helped follow through, or primary care docs who helped follow through. It was an inpatient unit for people who had addiction or, um, or brain tumors. Um, and the imaging unit was rarely used because in, um, in th with their combined expertise on thinking about when might this be a brain tumor and when might it not be a brain tumor, the concern that we were missing a brain tumor went way, way down. It wasn't any one person having to make that, that judgment call. So what happened with this was, with this integrated practice, was reduced pain. About 87% of the patients were reporting dramatically reduced pain, and, um, and I forget, it's about 90% of the patients reporting effective, uh, use, effective prophylaxis, effective prevention of migraines using the um, trigger management and the drugs that you can use if you start to notice the effects of a migraine. Um, increased days at work, they went from, um, uh, what was it, 54% of patients missing six or more days of work from a single migraine episode down to 11%. Okay, that's a lot of pain reduction. A lot of days back at work. Um, and then, lower overall cost of care, but it was really hard to prove initially because at first you were doing more for these patients. They were seeing more specialists. They were getting more care. And so for the first few months, the spending on these patients went up. But after 14 months' time, the overall spending on these patients had gone from being above average for the health plan to being below average for the health plan. It dropped almost 20% in, this, in, their, in spending because if you have Recurrent migraines, you can't sleep right, you can't eat right, you can't exercise right, you can't manage your relationships with your friends and family, you don't get to work. Things start to spiral downward as more and more things go wrong. Right? But if you stop that downward spiral and help people to get exercise and activity and you can spend time with your friends and you can go to work and you can eat right and you're sleeping well, your health starts to spiral up and these people became less expensive than average. So by 14 months, they could show that it, was, um, that it was overall less expensive. And then more and more people could then access care that actually worked instead of getting bounced around the old fragmented system. So that's an example of changing the way we deliver care, structuring the care around the patient rather than around the specialist, so around how we create value for the individual rather than how um, doctors advance professionally or how health plans traditionally pay. So here's another, um, another example. This example is from Delmet, looking at how we handle um, uh, hip and knee uh, arthritis, how we handle pa pain and um, potentially the need for replacement of a hip or a knee joint. So traditionally, people were kind of bounced around in the system, multiple disconnected appointments that people would need to make in order to get this help. Um, and what they're, what they're working on now is creating a team around the patient. That's not a target. That's supposed to be a person. Sorry, it's just the graphic. Um, we're trying to help them not shoot at them. Um, but so the team that would have a physician and a care coordinator and a physical therapist, um, and then it works out to um, a broader array. But right, right now, the team is mostly the in, the in close team, saying, what happens if you have a team on your side helping you to get the care right and helping you to follow through on the things that you need to do for yourself to improve your own health. So when they came in, these are, this is work that was done with a group of uninsured patients here in Travis County. And um, when this team started, there were, um, when the team, when it started, there were about um, 1,500 people on the wait, wait list. And as their work ramped up, it got to be over 2,000 people who were on the wait list to have a consult with an orthopedist. So with the orthopedic surgeon. So these people are in pain, either with their hip or their knee, and they're waiting um, for, for help. So the team came in, and rather than try to figure out how do we do the standard stuff and just do more and more of it in order to do it faster, they said, let's do it differently in order to do it better. And so the first thing they did was to have the orthopedic nurse practitioner call 
everyone on the wait list. Okay, that doesn't sound like dramatic innovation, but it had huge results because um, what happened was there were 600 people who were taking a space on the wait list whose problem was resolved. So the scheduling, if you guys were all on the wait list, the scheduling of your care was being held up by people who were going to be no-shows, but you couldn't have their appointment time because nobody knew that they no longer needed the help. Um, and then there were a bunch of people who needed, um, who needed to come in, and a whole bunch of these people actually had surgery. But these are people who really had an immediate problem and real pain and needed to be seen and came in and were seen. So the wait list, um, this is as of December, the wait list was down to about 900 patients. But that's a you know, tremendous reduction in, um, in the wait list. And what happened by doing that was that the waiting time went from, we can schedule your next appointment 14 months from now, to we can schedule your next appointment 28 days from now. That's a really different pain experience. So when I think about these waiting times, I don't think about it just as sort of calendar days and twiddling your thumb. If somebody's on the wait list to see someone about replacing a hip joint, they're not comfortable. This stuff hurts, right? Um, and so then for the patients who were, were operated on, um, now with a more team approach on how we counsel you about being ready for surgery and how we help you with physical therapy afterwards. The length of stay um, at the hospital had been 4.2 days. Our surgeons were getting a length of stay of two days. But it's not, I mean, they're great, but it's, it's not just that. Um, it's also the, the, the approach to team-based care. And then um, the whether you get, when you get discharged from the hospital, you can get discharged into a rehab center or you can get discharged to home. And um, patients who are doing better may be more likely to get discharged to home. But also, um, you tend to do better if you are discharged to home because you get into more normal activities and back to normal relationships and stuff. So almost 40% more patients were then discharged to, to home, the use of this model. So a small change. Uh, but real change in what's happening for these patients as a result of that small change. So how do you do these kinds of changes, and how do you do the bigger changes, like changes in, um, in, in the migraine care, or you know, changes that take us from having a kid with Down syndrome seen by a smattering of people so that the parents are needing to take them to different appointments on different days kind of all the time, to surround sound care by a team where when you go in, you're, you're in the embrace of care of a team and the things you need happen in an integrated way so that family life can continue. How do you, how do you even think about that kind of change? So the thing about value-based care was it said, Look, we can't keep doing our innovation in healthcare the way we've done it in the past. Because the way we did it in the past was to ask the doctors and the nurses, how would you make this better? And then try to give them the support to make it better. And what if instead you went to the individuals, to people, patients, families, but individuals, and figure out based on individuals what are the needs and what are the shared needs? So the thing that had stopped people in the past from trying to ask those questions is the notion that every person is individual. And we'd have to then create a myriad different types of care because everybody's different. OK, it's absolutely true. You're all individuals, and I'm individual. Got it. But that doesn't mean that the health problems that I have have never been seen before. I'm not. But if I were a woman with breast cancer, I would be in a community of women who'd had breast cancer of a particular type. And there would be experts who knew something about that, right? There, there are experts who know about that. And so the question is, can we design the services around those segments of people with shared needs so that you don't have to create customized care for everyone, but there's a way to get care that fits better? The way I like to think about this is to say, Think about it like shopping for clothes. I mean, when you go in, if you need a suit, you could hire a tailor and pick out fabric and 
create a, get a suit that really fits you perfectly. You could, absolutely. Or you can go in and know your size and get a suit that fits about right off the rack. If you want it to fit perfectly, small adjustments, a little bit of tailoring, alterations can get you to a suit that fits perfectly. So it's better to have sized suits to start with. Otherwise, we'd all be wearing togas. That one size fits all kind of works with togas, but not many other parts, pieces of clothing work very well with one size fits all. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, what we want to do is start from patients and families. We want to start from a segment of people with shared needs. So if you have type 2 diabetes and neuropathy and hypertension, there are lots of people who have all of those things and are navigating what it's like to live well to the best of their ability with those three things. Um, uh, and so that would be a segment. Or frail elderly patients. Not all elderly patients are frail. But if you have multiple chronic diseases um, and you're old, you're probably frail, which means a small thing can land you in the hospital. You know, can, um, but that's very different from frisky elderly. They have different needs, and they would be different segments. So it's not just a matter of age or where you live. I mean, if you think about your next door neighbor, absent a toxic spill or you know, some other you know, big event, uh, probably your neighbor's health, plan, health issues are different from yours. So it's not just about where you live or how old you are or what gender you are, but it's a question of what segment do you fit into in terms of medical needs. So if you start with an assessment of needs, then you can build high-value health care differently. And I paused here for a long time in part because your professor, Stacy, is one of the world's experts on design that starts with patients' needs and specifically in healthcare, right? So this whole notion of human-centered design is essential to high-value healthcare. And you do, indeed, have the privilege of working with one of the world's experts on that topic. So what you need to think about, then, for once you've identified needs, is what are the solutions that actually help people to improve their health or recover more fully or more or faster um, given the needs that they given the needs that they have and that this may involve things that we wouldn't normally consider to be medical we worked with one group was working with frail elderly and they needed to get people out walking and going out walking with your walker and all that is um, you know not uplifting to everybody and there's one woman they just couldn't get her to go out and they sat down and talked with her, and she said, I look so bad. I mean, I got these roots, and I got the, you know. They got hair dye, dyed her hair, so that she felt like she looked good. And two weeks later, she was on this walking regimen every day outside talking to her neighbors. There's another woman where they got the taxi service to pick her up regularly on Sundays and take her to church because they kept her as part of a community where she had friends which is good for her in terms of managing her health. So sometimes some of the things that get included aren't obviously medical, but are important to the whole picture so that people stay, stay on track. One of the big deals with, this, with solutions is when we have done a good job of thinking about design, we often think about it within the hospital or clinic walls, trying to make the solutions better in that confined context. But for chronic disease, which drives 80 to 90% of spending, depending on who you ask. For chronic disease, you need solutions that go outside of the hospital wall and help you to do the things you need to do to live better in your whole life, not just to have a better um, experience and a better, um, better understanding within the hospital walls. Right? So um, you want, you're thinking about these solutions throughout the person's life and how do we actually help enable health. To do that, to know what's working, you've got to be thinking about measuring the outcomes we achieve. Because stuff that you don't measure, it's hard to drive improvement in. But if you start measuring stuff, it's easier to then drive improvement um, across a team working together. 
you know, with the patient or the family at the center of that team. So measured outcomes are important. You need to measure things that are meaningful uh, to the patient and the clinical team. And you need to measure costs. Healthcare accounting is a really funny beast. In, <laughs> I got a nod back there. Um, most of the discussions about spending in healthcare are based on prices or reimbursement. They're, um, they're not usually based on what people, what, what the services actually cost to deliver. And most hospitals don't actually know, or doctor's offices don't actually know what it costs to deliver the services that they're delivering. That sounds a bit nutty. It wouldn't be true in other businesses. But the way the accounting is done, about half of the spending is considered overhead and then distributed to throughout the organization um, with more or less logic about how that distribution takes place. But in the rest of the economy, the portion of spending that might be distributed that way is like 5%. So there's this um, cost shifting that's going on in the accounting. It's legal. It's the way they're required to do the accounting now. But it makes it very hard to make good managerial decisions. So measuring costs is actually a big deal, not a small deal in healthcare. And actually, it's probably going to be a booming business in the early stages of your career. So if you've got a thing for numbers, this is probably going to be a, um, a, a, a big deal area. So to, to actually deliver solutions and measure the outcomes for every patient, you need a, an integrated team. You need an interdisciplinary team, not just a multidisciplinary team and a coordinator or a multidisciplinary group and a coordinator, but you need a team that really works together. It's going to measure outcomes together. It's going to learn together. It's going to drive improvement together. And this business about coordinators, we need them. If you've ever had a big adventure in healthcare, you know that coordinating yourself or having your parents or family try to coordinate it is a bit of a disaster, right? It's hard. So you need coordinators. But why are we adding a whole nother layer of administration rather than fixing the need for that for all those coordinators? So we work with these hospitals that realize that their patients needed coordinators, but lots of patients needed them. <coughs> So they ended up having a, so many coordinators that they needed coordinators of the coordinators. And over time, we discovered that they actually had hired a coordinator of the coordinators of coordinators. It's nature's way of telling you something. The system needs fixing, not just adding another layer. So I'm not saying coordinators are bad. If I had to have some major healthcare adventure right now, I would want one in the current system. But if we designed it better, there would be less need. So the idea is to, if we design it around the patients rather than designing it around the procedures and the payments and, the, um, and medical specialties, we might be able to um, have less need for that additional layer of bureaucracy. Um, once you've got teams, you can create a different kind of partnerships. You can create different payment models. And I'm not going to talk about that much today other than to say that right now, Medical success and financial success are completely different topics. It would be nice if that weren't true. It would be nice if financial success came with medical success rather than being somehow oddly independent of it. This notion of having teams would then suggest that we could use the system, the networks, differently than we use them today. We could figure out how to get the things that need to be close to home happening close to home with virtual or telemedical or team-based support that made it so that you could have more and more things done at your house or close to home with not local expertise, but national expertise or international expertise, state-of-the-art science delivered locally. Right now, we tend to have local expertise delivered locally and wild amounts of variance across the procedures that are done and the processes that are followed and the outcomes that are achieved. And the most famous studies show that the care that you get depends more on where you present for care than on the state of the art of medical science, which is kind of scary. 
So the idea of value-based growth, it's growth, it does include volume, but the idea would be then to come to a point where the things that are growing are the things that provide more value for patients, that get better outcomes, that improve health throughout our communities and throughout society. It's a different model of growth than saying, we're gonna capture as many patients as we can in our catchment area, and then use them as feeders to the hospital. Every time somebody refers to a primary care practice as a feeder, I shiver. Feeder? I really don't want my primary care feeding me into a hospital. I want it doing exactly the opposite. And it's not to say that your primary care doc is bad, but that's been the model. And that actually is the vocabulary that you encounter when you're looking at the way um, health systems think about their, um, their, their services. Kind of scary. And then when we think about IT, it's not a fix to the whole thing, but it's a way to enable support all the way along. And so what we think about is the information supply chain. What is it that each member of the, of the services needs to know from the person who came before? And how can we improve that communication uh, rather than um, just uh, how can we get everybody using electronic medical records that, imp that, that digitize the way we've done it for the last 20 years? You don't really want to just digitize the old-fashioned way of doing it. You want to figure out how can we actually improve communications along the way. So the thing about measurement now is that your healthcare providers and hospitals are required to report thousands of things, literally thousands of things. Most of the stuff that they're required to report has to do with process or, or structure. So it, most of it has to do with, did you give the aspirin on time? Um, did you wash your hands? Did you, as opposed to asking, not rather than did you wash your hands, did the patient get an infection? You know, what you really want to be doing is looking at the, the, the outcomes of it, not just the process. Internally, you want to know what are we doing to drive down our rate of infection. But in terms of external reporting, you really would love to have outcomes actually reported. And in this whole mess where nobody really knows how to make sense of processes, some of the required processes reporting is for stuff that is already out of date, which is problematic. So then we say, okay, well, let's report patient satisfaction. But then it's satisfaction with what? Again, we're back to the, it's not, was the pillow soft that you really want to report on? You know, um, and it shouldn't even have to be, were they polite to me? Really, they should be polite to me, right? Um, but really, you want to figure out, did they help? Are they, are we, did the care that's provided actually improve the health outcomes? So we're thinking here then about functional outcomes. You know, can you now walk with ease? Can you walk comfortably? Can you walk up the stairs? Can you go to work? Uh, you know, can you do the things you want to do? And so you're looking at the outcomes after care, and people will say, but that's 10 years from now. And say, okay, wait. We need to also look at the outcomes during care. And that's super important in a world where much of what we're dealing with is chronic disease, end of life, cancer, long-term things. Because during care may be the whole ballgame. Right? If, you have some, if you have diabetes, you will have it for the rest of your life. The question is, how well do you live? And so we need to be thinking about, can you do the things you want to do, not just after care, but during care? And that's also a pretty radical notion in uh, healthcare today. So the problem is, when you think about it this way, we keep asking the question, how were we? In fact, the most, the sort of biggest deal question recently has been, would you recommend me? And then from that, we create a net promoter score, which is what you do in most service businesses. Would you recommend this hotel? But there are lots of reasons why you might recommend your doctor even if the results hadn't been good. Um, some of them better reasons, some of them worse reasons. But I know when my son was sick, whenever they asked me about the doctors, I always said nice things. I knew they were trying as hard as they could. I certainly wasn't going to offend the people who were trying to take care of my son. Right? And nobody ever asked, can he sleep through the night? Can he go to school? They didn't ask those questions, which wouldn't have been, um, the, so they were asking, how were we? But it's healthcare. The fundamental question isn't how are we. The fundamental question is how are you? 
，它是 mom， 它是 son。That's why you're going. So that switch is a fundamental switch. But you don't ask it that vaguely. That's not usually the way it, you ask. So what we found is you ask about specific capabilities. So if it's knee surgery, you want to know if the person can walk. If they have diabetes, you want to make sure they can see that their that retinopathy hasn't left them blind. Right? I mean, so there are different capabilities depending on what you have. If you have head and neck cancer, the question is, can you swallow? Can you talk? It's a, but capability to do the things that you need to be able to do. Comfort. Are we reducing pain, physical or emotional? And calm, the calm that enables family life. If you have a chronic disease or you have, or someone's at end of life, the question is, you know, does, does sort of life go on for the patient, for the family? Does life, does life continue? during this treatment? Or does everybody stop and panic during the treatment? Which is fairly common today. But so we're thinking in terms of capability, comfort, and calm as the types of outcomes that we're looking to improve. And you'll notice that they're all framed positively for two reasons. One is when you ask patients about their care team, they want to tell you what they do right. They want to say, we tend to love our doctors and nurses, and you want to you give those. And the other thing is when you're working with a care team, I have yet to meet a team that wanted to be judged on how much it did or didn't suck. Right? You, you, you want to be judged on how good you are and what you're achieving. You don't want to be judged in negative terms. So when you're measuring outcomes that matter to patients, you support clinicians' professionalism. We have a big problem today with burnout. And, um, and doctors just feeling they're constantly being asked to do more, do more, do more. But when you're measuring successes in things that really matter to your patients, you reattach people to their aspiration to help. And that's a good thing. And then it also then communicates earnest empathy in a very natural way. Because really, you're be when you're asking the right kinds of questions, they have that tone of asking, how are you? Which says, I care. And that matters. Um, and it supports both the patients and the physicians when you approach it that way. You know who John Wooden is? Basketball. Do you know who John Wooden is? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Who's John Wooden? Okay, right? His comment, yeah, most successful college basketball coach ever, right? He says, the best competition I have is against myself to become better. And so when people think about, is competition appropriate in healthcare? Answer, yes, when it's this, right? Um, if every day we're competing to do better and better for our own patients, if every day we're trying to get our team to be better, it's not playing against your teammate. It's playing with your teammate to succeed more and more. So that's the competition you want in healthcare. 